Hey folks, we're going to be discussing Terrifier today, a movie series synonymous with gratuitous violence and gore. I'm not even going to try and monetize this video, so enjoy an ad-free experience beyond the upcoming sponsor. The uncensored version of this video, alongside all of the other Halloween reviews, is available on Patreon. But unless you really, really care about seeing the visuals, you're not going to miss anything by watching this version here on YouTube. Good morning party people. Before we start, I wanted to mention, I've been a huge fan of a clothing company called Cool Shirts for ages. I've been wearing Cool Shirts clothing in a ton of my videos for easily a year. And amazingly, they found my content and Sarah from the Cool Shirts team reached out to say hello. They sent me some goodies, which was super nice of them. And they've also given me my own affiliate link and a 10% discount code to share with all of you. With Christmas coming up, I can recommend them as banger gifts because I always get my mum to buy them for me. And if you would like to get your hands on the items that I've been wearing for ages for free, check out my link in the description and use the code COOLMERTS, that's C-O-O-L-M-E-R-T-S, for 10% off your order. I will be wearing a few pieces throughout the video, including this bag boy so you can kind of check them out see what they look like on a person and judge them for yourself for reference i'm five foot four and like size size 12 ish so i'm wearing a small and it's actually a little bit big for me so there's plenty of space in these anyway Let's get on with the video. The Terrifier series is one that has quickly garnered an earned reputation amongst movie viewers. It's the kind of shock porn gore fest that revels in utter needless violence, performed by one iconic Art the Clown, a black and white circus fiend who is as whimsical as he is dangerous. I was really anxious to watch the Terrifier movies for quite a while. As you've probably gleaned from my general tastes, especially if you're a patron and you've been watching the Halloween reviews that I've been doing, I love excessive violence. Excessive violence is right up my alley. This is exactly my kind of film. I knew I would love Terrifier, but at the same time, I've grown hesitant to fly too close to the sun. One day, something will traumatize me. I'm just waiting for that day to arrive. Luckily, while I can say now, in hindsight, that this day did not come, I can say that I absolutely love Terrifier. And I absolutely hated Terrifier too. So for our final video of the 31 Days 31 Movies Patreon project, and an excuse for me to wear more cool shirts in my videos, let's discuss both movies in one go. A review of Terrifier 1 and Terrifier 2. Coming right up. Terrifier 1 was preceded by some strange anthology movie from 2013 I've never seen called All Hallows' Eve, which was in turn preceded by 2009's The Ninth Circle, which served as a surprisingly early start for Art the Clown, who I wasn't aware had been a thing for that long. Terrifier came along three years later, which is where his notoriety really began. I've seen a lot of people refer to Terrifier as mean-spirited. In fact, I see a lot of torture porn described that way, and even as I named the genre, I realised that it certainly penned its Self into that association. Personally, one of the reasons I really enjoy torture porn specifically is because I like to imagine a collection of actors coming together and having a lot of fun screaming and pretending to be in an incredible amount of pain. Obviously, this is on a case-by-case -case basis. It will depend on the film. Wolf Creek, for example, is a torture porn movie that I actually would consider to be mean-spirited, considering it's apparently based on a true story and yet it's entirely falsified at the same time. Wolf Creek is a movie based on two instances of kidnap and murder of tourists in Australia, but it's really not based on anything. The movie is a this is what we assume happened based on zero evidence nor witness testimony, but rather just a cruel sequence of horrific acts performed on two women. Yet the movie was apparently extremely fun to work on and morale was very high amongst members of cast and crew. I think with those assumptions in mind, I tend to see torture porn, particularly with as whimsical an antagonist as Art the Clown, as just a heap of silly fun. A room full of actors who are hopefully having a laugh behind the scenes, seeing how far they can go with ludicrous acts of violence. So yeah, I'm into it. I like this kind of film. Terrifier is a film that on the whole defies analysis. It's like Tom and Jerry, two entities that chase each other in a feud that never quite finds resolution, just battering the shit out of one another. It's slapstick bollocks, one individual's exploration of how far two cartoon characters can be flung around before the ratings board gets involved. Unless you're about to tell me that Tom and Jerry represented the Cold War, in which case I would scorn you. Consider yourself scorned. I could sit there all day and come up with no real understanding as to why art is the way he is, whether the black and white motif means anything, whether that honking great nose has any relevance, whether he makes any reference to anything that already exists. He just seems to be this big malevolent idiot. He's more natural disaster than he is serial killer, enacting concentrated massacres over the course of mere hours and then vanishing again. The events of the movies, the characters, the stories, the violence, there's nothing here. So yeah, maybe it is vapid, but it's great fun and I love it. So let's talk about it. Terrifier 1 begins 
begins with a striking scene. Not striking as in violent, but striking as in surprisingly pretty. We see a small TV framed by darkness and scattered illuminations of red paint and red lighting. A few terrifier scenes are just like this, these really deliberately positioned shots that actually look really good. Like, I would have this moment framed and put on my wall, this is poster-esque. It's a great shot to begin the movie with, although I can't say that they uphold this standard. Most of the terrifier movie takes place in dingy apartment buildings and on dark streets that look like Silent Hill transitional spaces. Still, the Terrifier series so far has its fair share of moments where you can only take a step back and be like, damn bitch, you shoot like this? Damn. Anyway, this scene features a woman sitting down to interview the sole survivor of an event dubbed the Miles County Massacre. The face of this survivor has been disfigured beyond repair and quite cruelly, her face is all the reporter is really asking questions about. As someone who is clearly struggling to adapt to the way people now see her, this is obviously a difficult conversation for this survivor to have. Luckily, we don't have to listen for long as an angry Art kicks the TV to pieces. Art steps out of the shadows looking like a custom GTA character in his pre-heist cutscene, like when my brother and I would play golf and he'd just be there in his underwear with an eagle mask on. In the game, obviously. The simplicity of Art's design is what makes him so memorable, I feel. There's nothing CGI nor especially impressive about Art beyond some of the most resilient, smudge-resistant makeup I've ever seen. Seriously, it may as well be tattooed onto his body. I have no idea how they've managed to sellotape this eyeliner onto him. His costume is a very basic affair in reality. He dresses entirely entirely in plain black and white, including this cheap little silky onesie he flaps around in like a McDonald's napkin in the wind. Seriously, the end result is a vision similar to watching a toddler skim the garden in their pyjamas. I'll say it now, nice and early. Art is the best part of both movies, hands down. That's by design, obviously, but the difference in quality between art and everything else is alright in Terrifier 1, but the difference in quality between art and everything else is fucking abyssal in Terrifier 2. It's a tragic difference in quality. By the end of Terrifier 1 I began to realise yeah, I'm only watching this for art and his antics, and for those of you who have seen Terrifier 2 already, you're gonna be able to predict why I didn't really like that film. In the next scene, we cut to the interviewer speaking on the phone in her dressing room. In the typical first death of a horror movie fashion, she is an absolutely awful person. This reporter is insanely cruel about the survivor of the massacre, commenting, if I ever look like that, put me out of my misery. And in that fun horror movie karma, the latter part of her sentence is heard and honoured. Terrifier harkens back to a lot of contemporary horror movie tropes. Girls in skimpy Halloween costumes, insane slasher characters that can't be reasoned with, protagonist brain rot, etc. But this one's a little bit more subtle. Slasher, killer, karmic, justice. Now, the reporter dies horribly regardless, she is brutally mauled to death, but I am so used to seeing women dying in horror movies after a sequence of events that involves them having sex or behaving promiscuously, so much so that I actually noticed that this particular Halloween slasher horror bonanza doesn't seem to make any judgement on the sexual activity of its characters. I know this is an extremely low bar, but after watching the original Friday the 13th, Nightmare on Elm Street, Scream, countless others, the amount of women murder that happens immediately following a sexual encounter is not only evident but also like thoroughly explored by tons of other people in depth. I have no wish to go over this. Final girls are often virginal, if not virgins, whereas characters that engage in sex, no matter how consensual, are often brutally murdered. And yeah, the bar is on the floor here, but I took abundant notice of the fact that the reporter is just a shithead. I was like, oh my god, an actual bastard dying after just behaving like a bastard. How slightly progressive how wild. Characters are murdered regardless of their sex throughout this entire movie. What a man of the future art, thank you very much. Hearing a noise behind her, the reporter goes to investigate and gets jump scared by the girl from before, who pushes her to the floor and messily gouges her eyes out, killing her. This is an abrupt introduction to the movie's spectacular special effects, an Olympic level of simulating blood and guts galore. We see like a full dethroned eyeball just loitering in the mess of her cheek. As far as visual violence goes, this is right up there. I really enjoyed this scene. With all of this out of the way, we cut to two seemingly unrelated women who are walking home from a night out. This is Tara, the angry little raven character, and Dawn, the clear starfire of the two. Their names aren't especially relevant to the turn of events, I had to check them on IMDB as I wrote this, which isn't great considering I watched this film very closely. Judging by the costumes, they were clearly out at a Halloween party or a Halloween themed club night. They both look great, dressed to the nines in dresses that I wouldn't trust to survive drunken shenanigans, but they've clearly practiced their craft for a while and are masters at keeping slippages to a minimum, if only I could learn their ways. Tara 
Sarah is right in the middle of stopping Dawn from putting her keys in the car door, good woman, friends don't let friends drive drunk, when Art approaches. He watches them from the alley until Dawn starts shouting at him. After a moment, he disappears. I like that Art is so synonymous with Terrifier. You'd have to be living under a rock to not recognise this character by this point, so I imagine the people who watched this without realising immediately that this pair were in deep, deep trouble were a blissfully ignorant crowd. Still, there is a specific tragedy to this scene too, being that the wheel of events is already set in motion. Once Art notices you, you're dead, no question about it. May as well just lie back and close your eyes for your inevitable disembowelment. In the upcoming Terrifier 3, I would love a character to make eye contact with Art, sigh, and then just blow their brains out. Anyway, the ladies need to sober up before they can drive, still not advisable by the way, but whatever, and they head to a late night pizza joint. It actually looks pretty scrumptious. Over here in the UK, there'd be three kebab shops called Masterchef, Bradford Kebab and Pizza, and King Pizza, and there would definitely be no table service like these girls get. Instead, it would be a weary-eyed man at the till who can't hear you asking for a fuckload of garlic mayo over the chatter of the other drunk fools at the shop. Tara scrolls through her phone, inspecting a camera roll that has clearly been added in post, which I felt was a funny detail. I assume phones always have to look like shit in movies because it might infringe on copyright to make a proper one, but I can't be sure. Either way, this looked bizarre. I guess they spunked all of their money on fake eyeballs. Art strolls in, having now become an inevitable part of their short lives. He's like an omen, but an omen of himself. Once you notice him, you're going to die. That's definitely the scariest concept of these films. Once you see Art in any capacity, no matter the steps you take to walk away like nothing happened, he will kill you. I love that. Like, what can you do in that situation? What would you do? Art, clearly having taken a particular liking to a very grumpy Tara, sits and stares at her, and she just stares back, glaring at him. Now, this behaviour was pretty unrealistic. Strange man staring at you in a pizza shop? My eyes would be on the table, or maybe on my phone, and I'd definitely be telling my group chat so that they had a lead for when I inevitably wound up dead, evil demon clown or not. Dawn climbs into Art's lap, and Art sits quietly but angrily as she takes a selfie with him. And you're sitting there like, girl, no, leave him alone. Please get off him, you're making a terrible mistake. Although, that being said, she's dead anyway, may as well enjoy it. After staring weirdly at the two women, Art gets up and goes to the bathroom, and this led us into that one scene in the movie that really got to me. I ended up doing this little wretch down the microphone as I was watching, which got me laughed at throughout the movie by my brother, and it's the bit with all the poo. Uh. That made you wretch. I'm really bad with shit, Alex. You got a glass stomach, pal. I love my face has gone bright red. I just, I really hate poo. When Tara and Dawn return to Dawn's car to find the tyres flat, surprise, surprise, they call our third protagonist of the movie, Tara's sister Vicky. I really didn't care for Vicky, but we'll get to that. Although she is introduced to us in a scene where two people walk into her room and just start boning on her bed, which is ludicrous, I'll give the movie that. The gentleman at the pizza shop gets brutally murdered, one of them is refashioned into a literal jack-o'-lantern, and the other gets de-handed and stabbed in the face quite a lot. Circle of life though, isn't it? Despite Dawn's drunkenness, she she was probably my favourite character in this film. She's a little obnoxious when she's drunk, but not too obnoxious, more just silly, a little polarising, but assertive. When Tara asks a janitor for a nearby building if she can use their toilet, and he responds like, mmm, probably not, sorry. Dawn shouts at him from the car to just let her piss, and it kind of took me out. You know, what a woman's woman. We love natural born cheerleaders. Go on, Dawn. The janitor takes Tara to this toilet and it's absolutely fucking filthy. Like, isn't this your job to clean, sir? Can you not even run a mop over these tiles? This is your craft. You should be ashamed. Maybe this is why he was initially hesitant to let Tara in. Look at the fucking state of it. This film hasn't seen a wipe down since 1921. In the meantime, Dawn is sitting in the car listening to a breaking news story at like 3am. The report describes the two workers at the pizza place having been brutally murdered murdered, the key suspect being a man dressed like a clown. And she's like, oh shit. And we're like, Dawn, we told you this was gonna happen. And there he is, Art is in the car, in a tense moment we know is gonna be a jump scare. Not a bad jump scare, just a basic jump scare. We can do better than this, Terrifier, let's try to up the ante a little bit next time, and then we cut away. But don't worry guys, Dawn is probably fine. Tara runs into a strange older woman in the hallway of the complex that's listed on IMDB as Cat Lady. Despite owning no cats, that's a bit rude, she coexists with the stray cats of the building Building, but she doesn't seem to own any herself. You may as well just call her decrepit spinster whose loins have dried up if we're on this route, but I guess that would be too long for the credits. In the next scene, I could only laugh at myself. Tara walks out to see Art standing there. He just stands frozen in a pouncing pose for a very long time before jumping at her with a noise spike, and I have to say, I'm ashamed to admit it, but it, it got me. I did jump. Consider the ante upped. I'm such a sucker for noise spikes, this, this got me really bad. This
This leads to a fun chase around the indoor garage that was honestly very tense. I struggled to watch it. The difficulty as the audience of engaging with a scene like this is that the shots chosen are framed in a really, really inefficient way. And this is obviously intentional. Most of what we see while watching this scene are shots of Tara or shots of art, making it almost impossible to understand the spatial situation in the garage. How close is he to her? What are her options? Where can she run? Can he see her at all? The way the scene is constantly framed keeps us from understanding anything useful whatsoever about the chase, meaning that we are left in the hands of Tara who is about to prove herself to be woefully incapable. Being reliant on our main character to understand exactly what is going on and how creates an unstable feeling of anxiety that makes scenes like this unbearable, a feeling that often works its way into anger. This is when you get the oh my god just run exclamations because it's the only way you feel like you can regain any control over the situation you're watching. I really appreciate the subtle way this scene was directed and filmed. I think it's easy to miss since camera shots can often feel so coincidental, but everything here felt intentional in such a way as to cultivate feelings of claustrophobia and stress, and it works. Tara manages to fight Art off and loses him in the scuffle, for the better and the worse, since she's now not about to be horribly murdered, but she also has no idea where he is, and that's not good at all, especially since Tara, who has been a reasonably reasonable protagonist so far, is about to fall foul of protagonist brain rot, a terminal condition that inflicts many horror movie protagonists, affecting reasoning and logic skills first. Tara gets to the foyer of the apartment building to see the doors chained closed, but the chain is still swinging very hard, implying that Art has only just fastened the chains, like within the last 60 seconds. Frustratingly, Tara's first instinct is to make a hell of a lot of noise trying to open it, slamming herself against the door and shaking the chain as hard as she can. But if the chain is still swinging, he's probably not gone that far, Tara. This decision isn't the wisest, like come on girl. It's only when Tara finds the janitor, cleaning with his headphones blaring music, that Tara screams at him for help, over and over again. He doesn't hear her over his music, and Art yoinks Tara before the janitor can even turn around, and we get to the scene everyone's heard of. All I can say about this scene is that the build-up is ten times worse than the actual gore. Tara is tied to a chair and Dawn is suspended naked from the ceiling, and Art is swaggering around between them like a weird little bird. My friends and I were in ribbons watching Art fuck around with a saw, fainting back and forth towards Dawn and Tara. When he unveils Dawn and puts a saw up to her coochie, I was like, nah, no thanks. Oh, I don't know where this is. Oh, going. shit. Fuck no. off. Fuck I've off. Away fuck off. Of fuck mind. off. But honestly, once he gets started, it's not that bad. Not that bad now because it's clearly made of plastic. Yeah, the tension leading up to that scene was so much worse than the scene itself. The ordeal is over surprisingly quick, considering it's a handsaw cutting through a significant amount of bone. You'd expect that to take longer. Tara, Little Miss Self-Preservation, manages to get loose and stabs Art once with a knife and runs off, leaving that loose-boweled clown to collect himself off the floor. She comes back with a plank, whacking him over the head multiple times, but pulling her punches in a way that really annoyed me. Protagonist Brain Rot is real. Having watched this man brutally murder her friend in front of him, she pulls an Oberyn Martell and tries to engage in fair hand-to-hand -hand combat, demanding he get up and fight her properly. And the whole time you're like, girl, please just knock him out. What is this? But honestly, despite all my rage, this scene breeds the funniest kill I've ever seen. It turns out that Art has a fucking sock glock. He whips it out of nowhere and just shoots her dead. Then he stands up and shoots her several more times with the coldest, deadest expression. Art channels Clint Eastwood and I have to say that I was laughing the entire time. As Tara is getting Swiss cheesed by a clown who doesn't play by the rules, Vicky arrives to collect her and Dawn. She calls Tara on her phone, a detail that Art does not miss, and he gleefully pounces on the opportunity for more needless, wanton murder. The older woman, having seen Art and been noticed by him in return, uh-oh, runs to the janitor to beg him to call the police. She's definitely the smartest character in this movie, and certainly the most proactive one, but because of her situation, he just assumes she's insane and won't take her seriously. This pans out pretty well, pretty fast, as the janitor is clocked with a hammer and falls unconscious on the stairs. The woman goes running away, ending up in some tunnel beneath the building. She slams on a door to no avail, pushing it and pulling it and we were like, it's a sliding door. Will it not just slide open? But I'll assume not since when she turns around, Art is sitting on the floor with a porcelain doll she has been carrying around the entire film as she considers it to be her baby. He does this little disapproving gesture, annoyed by all the noise she's making. It's so funny, Art is so well acted. Despite being a silent character, all of his mannerisms absolutely hit the spot. He is a fantastic character to watch on screen, even without all the killing. I guess he is more of a mime, despite his name being Art the Clown, but whatever. Completely trapped in the tunnel, 
tunnel, she can't run, she can't fight, so she tries to befriend. Giving Art some speech about her mother's love, she goes to hug him and he pretends to respond well to it. I feel like this strategy might work great in maybe any other film. Unfortunately, it doesn't pan out here. Vicky finds her scalped and de-breasted, horribly disfigured, only to get chased through the apartment building by Art himself, wearing the cat lady's head and breasts in some weird display. He gives the performance of a lifetime, to be fair, strutting around and owning this new costume, and honestly, it's a good thing Art carries this movie so much, because his back must be hurting after that second half with Vicky. Like, I'm super compassionate towards horror movie protagonists. I get super annoyed when I'm watching horror movies with people and they are shouting at the characters to do something that the character isn't reasonably going to know about. Run upstairs, they shout when the character doesn't even know there's an upstairs, or doesn't know that the upstairs is safe, or doesn't know that there's an exit upstairs. Kill him now, they shout as they're stood over the villain, as though as humans we aren't conditioned to murder, and threatened with life imprisonment if we do, making it a very deliberate choice that you can't take very lightly. Nobody Nobody in this horror movie is going to know, having just met Art, that he is going to chase them to supernatural lengths. I get really bothered by the people who are like, just do this, just do that, because in a situation of adrenaline, you're probably not going to just do that. It, it's a pet peeve, it, it really winds me up. That passionate speech aside, Vicky is really something. She really bothers me. Stepping far beyond the realms of human reasoning, I watched that woman cram herself into cupboards, run back into the building multiple times, and constantly sit quietly in situations that anyone could take advantage of. Even when she has time to think, she bungles it hard. What did you think would happen when you found you hiding in the cupboard, Vicky? Why did you corner yourself like this so badly? When Art walks off to kill the maintenance guy who's just arrived on scene, Vicky doesn't leave the cupboard despite having a, about a five good minutes to do so, but that felt a bit more reasonable. How many times in your life have you missed an opportunity to go because you were too anxious, only to end up leaving it too long? It's understandable for her to assume that Art might have just pretended to have left as well, just to fuck with her, so in this moment at least I was sympathetic. He comes riding through the garage in a silly bike and, oh man. Art and Vicky's chase goes on for a long time. And I think that's the issue with the second part of this movie. From what we've seen, when Art sees you, you're basically dead in five minutes. He has supernatural teleporting abilities, perfect luck, the senses of a predator. He murders anybody within the blink of an eye, including our final girl fake out Tara. And I like the stakes of Art, he's a gruesome death sentence for anybody who deals with him. Except, I suppose, if you are supposed to survive until the end. Now, this isn't going to be a drastic issue until Terrifier 2, but in Terrifier 1 we begin to see the budding disparity between the stakes of Art and the reality of the writing. The problem with Vicky in particular is that she is not especially clever nor agile, doesn't know the map well, doesn't have any weapons nor any strategy, and yet she manages to wiggle away from art for the length of like 30 full minutes through so many opportunities for brutal instant death. It's just a Tom and Jerry chase that goes on way too long. Sure, there are some funny moments, like when she peels away the plastic he tries to suffocate her with, shedding new light on every character in film and TV that's been suffocated with the equivalent of a Tesco bag, and some extremely funny moments like the disgruntled middle finger he gives her when she stabs him in the foot, but despite the laughs, this second half of the movie was really frustrating to watch, dragged down by Vicky and her characterisation in particular. It is straight up unpleasant. Watching her discover her dead sister only to sit on the floor with her legs crossed and loudly cry with her back to the door is a recipe for annoyance. Luckily, the janitor saves her in this moment, he leads her away, a man with a plan, and calls the police. They then go to leave, and I feel like maybe they could have sat in this room and reasonably defended themselves, maybe, but the janitor also quite reasonably wants to make a break for it, so I understood the consideration for both options here. Unfortunately, the back door is chained too, and the janitor loses his head in this fruitless search. Vicky stabs Art in the eye and runs out of the building and then goes back into the building. Yes, even I was sitting there baffled. In a car park full of cars, including her own, Vicky's first instinct is to stagger back into the apartment building and wait for the police. In her defence, we can hear the sirens, and you'd expect these streets to be crawling with the police, considering there's been a double homicide close by and a murderer on the loose, but by the same merit this felt so incredibly dumb. The janitor and the first two girls behaved with some degree of intelligence, considering the situation they went into entirely unprepared. Sure, Tara's logical ability dipped towards her inevitable death, but having these characters on the chopping block for a swift kill meant that they could be clever in their approach because Art would just outsmart them or overpower them and kill them. His stakes gave them space to be especially clever and skilled and resourceful protagonists because they simply wouldn't beat him anyway. But with Vicky, we have like 30 unforgivable minutes of brain melt. Art soon drives his car through the door Vicky had bolted shut, knocking her unconscious. The police arrive to find him eating her face, and Art's not the kind of man to go quietly, so a swift, self
self-inflicted gunshot to the chin and he's in a body bag to be carted off scene to the morgue when nothing happens and Art is quietly autopsied and the murders end for good. Mate. <laughs> you shut your goddamn eyes. Real quick just now, before we get into Terrifier 2, let's sum up my opinion of Terrifier 1. I think it's a really good movie with a solid main antagonist. Art's supernatural abilities make him so formidable that, really, all you can do is lie down and die when he takes notice of you. He's a terrifying force to be reckoned with, despite his whimsy, and he's played super well by a really talented actor who injects his mannerisms with so much character, despite the fact that Art never speaks. I really liked him. Beyond that, there's no actual plot beyond these the final few hours of a bunch of people who have inadvertently encountered art and now must suffer the unfair advantages of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. But I'll be honest with you, I don't watch this stuff for the plot. I watch it so that I can experience the innovative ideas of a group of filmmakers who want to test the tensile strength of the human body. Overall, this movie's good fun. It's great to watch in groups. Now, let's move on to the sequel. So I only wrote seven individual comments in my notes whilst watching Terrifier 2. My notes for Terrifier 1 came out to like three full pages, but I dislike Terrifier 2 so much that I barely scraped a paragraph. So, what's wrong with it? As with the previous movie, Art is the strongest part of the film by a mile. Art is the glue holding this film together, alongside the little pale girl, a clown friend and confidant who manifests more like a ghostly supervisor than as a part of the actual action. Yet, Terrifier 2 was dragged down primarily by an immensely boring story. Terrifier 2 is a two hour, 20 minute film, and it really, really does not manage to stay afloat under that burden. The momentum is stop and start, and it drags its belly across the the floor for an abundance of the runtime. The film is stretched out by a very dumb story I did not remotely care about, and we are forced to spend the bulk of the runtime with some of the most irritating characters I've ever seen in film. Like, I know that I ragged on Vicky's annoying character choices in the first movie. Man, you've not seen anything yet. Terrifier 2 is pure frustration, so bad that we stopped it halfway through and came back to it four days later to finish it, bored out of our minds. So, let's get into it. Terrifier 2 starts directly at the end of Terrifier 1 in the morgue. It looks like the ending wasn't so happy after all, the morgue guy, covered in blood, is brutally murdered by Art, like he gets his brain involved, which is a rarity for the slasher horrors I've seen. This makes for an impactful beginning for a narrative that is about to drag itself along its belly for far too long, but at least the first 20 or so minutes of Terrifier 2 gave the impression that you were about to enjoy an entertaining film. After beating the brains out of the morgue man, Art heads off to the laundromat to clean his clothes and sits there in his briefs while his stuff is swirling in the washer. He's joined by another character, a character I actually really like, this little clown girl who definitely seems to have more of an insidious presence than is ever explained across the course of this film, although she might see some exploration in Terrifier 3, which is due out next year. Her scenes are some of my favourite scenes in the movie, and I especially love her glowing orange eyes. She is here to unload a fucking barge of wet shit on the floor, maintaining unblinking eye contact the entire time, but this scene is also intended to demonstrate that while art is very real, the clown girl is some kind of ghost. She can't be seen by the other laundromat visitor, but she can be seen by some later characters, so it's a setup that pays off later without being outright stated by anybody in the film. You just suddenly realise that you can see her, and the main characters can see her, but the peripheral characters can't. At this point we get introduced to Sienna, a character I could not like at all if I tried. There are some details about Sienna that prove interesting. For example, her father recently passed away, however shortly before this he heard voices and saw abrupt and dangerous personality changes. He drew pictures of art and left her a special magical sword. Yeah. I think the movie kind of teases the idea that Art is her father, it's an overwhelming theory online, or this maybe is what her father became, which is a cool premise, but unfortunately it couldn't have happened to a less underwhelming main character. Sienna was devoid of personality, abundantly unlikable, and her presence really drowned this film. Whatever plot development she had was eyebrow wrinkling at best. I've not seen such a badly written character since Quizilla existed. In fact, Sienna feels like a Mary Sue self-insert from someone's fanfiction, where they write themselves as a cool teenage girl who dresses like a sexy Valkyrie is haunted by her past and is secretly Art's daughter. Because real talk fanfiction fans, but they're always the antagonist's daughter. Her destiny seems to be to kill Art, and as I describe her I'm not entirely sure whether I'm against the idea of Sienna. I think this concept might work with some better setup, payoff, and an entirely rewritten character that actually engages the audience on any level, but it's just done so poorly. Probably because, as with Vicky, her entire characterization and purpose is at odds with the stake and function of Art, creating 
a frustrating friction that permeates every scene featuring the two of them together, and I'll discuss this as I go. I mean, I checked out some opinions on Reddit, and I do seem to be largely outnumbered on this opinion, but I couldn't stand Sienna, nor Jonathan, her brother. Jonathan is a really weird one. He's played by the very capable Elliot Fulham, a now 19 year old who seems very bright and very talented, but I feel like this role was written for somebody much, much younger. Elliot was 16 years old when filming Terrifier 2, but a lot of his dialogue and a lot of his actions are very infantilized. For example, where he refers to his parents as mummy and daddy consistently without a shred of sarcasm. A lot of his dialogue comes off very clunky, he just seems to announce it out loud, and I couldn't help but feel like his character was initially written to be very young, maybe around 10 years old. His behavior is also very toddler-esque, he just blunders around most of the scenes he's in. He trips over a lot during his chase scenes and is easily overpowered by art. And I mean, most people are probably easily overpowered by art, but still. If my assumption is true, then for whatever reason they went in with a character in his mid to late teens without taking the time to adjust any of his dialogue for any of his scenes. Consequently, Jonathan comes off as like cluelessly childlike and very shrill. And I say this with affection, 10 year olds are childlike and shrill, but they actually have a reason to be because they're children. Anyway, yeah, I didn't like our central characters whatsoever, which is a great start. Jonathan is introduced to us during a discussion he's having with his family in which he claims to want to dress up as art for Halloween, which threw me for a loop a little bit. I initially assumed that art was some strange unknown entity that wanders the land, leaving no witnesses alive, maybe only very occasionally killing. Yet in Terrifier 2, he comes off as much more of a pop culture icon, like maybe on the same level as Slender Man or Skibbity Toilet? What an honor. Either way, I'm unsure, and the film doesn't clarify. Afterwards, Sienna is channel surfing before bed and encounters the Clown Cafe Network, and we watch a scene that takes place in a location I've seen a lot of other people refer to as purgatory. I don't know where they got that from, whether it's referenced to as such in interviews or something, or whether I just missed a particular line of dialogue, but I didn't get the impression that this was purgatory. It seemed like one of those creepypasta kid shows that gets a little bit edgy, you know, a little bit don't hug me I'm scared. These scenes are mainly here to give Sienna a reason to be in close proximity to art without needing to be in any real risk of danger, since there is clearly an awareness that having Sienna in art's company is only going to begin ticking a clock towards an inevitable death, and still, I didn't really care for these scenes. Sienna herself appears on set and we see weird art cereal full of razor blades that some kid is eating. We see teenagers playing on a playground, we see homeless people, nuns, and art himself. Sienna is presented with a gift by art, a box with a still beating heart inside it being consumed by maggots. I think one of the major factors in what makes this scene so weird for me is in just how quickly Art's magical powers have like ramped up. In the first movie, they're definitely present in his apparent invincibility, his light teleportation, and his complete resurrection at the end. But now he's like dream casting out his own realm of oblivion to people who have never met him before. And I think it just ramps up too fast to feel anything less than out of place. Ultimately, this scene doesn't serve a lot beyond giving Art an opportunity to be like whimsically gruesome in an area that Sienna can't die in. And I feel like the movie could probably have done without it. As she uses the sword she finds in the art cereal box to deflect art's fire, yes I know how that sounds, she wakes up in bed to find she was sleeping the whole time, except the wings of her costume have set ablaze and are now merrily burning on the opposite side of the room. The blade that's been foreshadowed several times is unburnt by the flames, so that's like our third foreshadowing in ten minutes. That must mean it's important, right? Art starts manifesting in surprisingly harmless ways, like playing with a dead opossum on the floors of the school, to the horror of Jonathan who finds him. But if we're leaning into this art is your dad theme, maybe this is another pointer towards it. But again, I just felt like maybe the runtime was long and they knew they needed to drop some art scenes in here and there to stop the audience from getting bored. And I lean towards the latter here. It just seems as though they were trying to keep the movie from falling into a lull, which it does anyway. Indeed, we get art scenes galore, one of the strongest character driven scenes in this movie, and literally one of the only Sienna scenes I enjoyed, took place in the costume shop. Here we see Sienna chatting to her friend as they buy new wings under the supervision of the very bored clerk with a cameo from Art who is being his typically whimsical self. He brings her purse when she says she's forgotten it, which has surprisingly apt comedic timing, and then stands there trying on glasses, which was again just charming, it's funny. Typically a scene like this is a strong one since in Terrifier 1 this would probably be used to demonstrate how Art stalks his prey, so in the original movie everybody in that shop would be dead within eight minutes. Sure, the 
clerk dies horribly, but both girls walk off unscathed, at least for now. What doesn't work for me about these scenes is that they're just foreplay, and it goes on for so long. Like, I'm ready, you know, it's done its job, let's crack on with this. Sienna gets home to find her brother with their late father's sketchbook, featuring tons of newspaper articles focused on Art's killing, some paintings of him, which are pretty good to be fair, and some other general clues and context that will no doubt come in useful later. Seeing this as a harbinger of clown fueled murder, Jonathan tries to make Sienna stay at home to avoid the bloodshed and is dismissed. I'm sure she won't regret that. Then we get on to the scene that everyone knows. I heard a lot about this scene, it's particularly famous, and what I heard about it definitely made me expect something that might make me straight up blow chunks, but it ended up being so outlandishly ridiculous and so relentlessly cruel that I found it very funny. It's definitely bad, but by the same merit, it's also nowhere near as bad as I expected it to be. So if you're scared of watching this movie because you've heard about this scene, I wouldn't worry too much. It's a rough scene, but it's so ludicrous that it is almost comedy. This scene features Ali, the girl who attended the costume shop with Sienna earlier in the movie. Art knocks on the door, pretending to trick or treat, and Ali recognises him to his delight. She refuses to give candy to grown-ups, slamming the door in his face. And while I do think that disrespect seems to factor into Art's killings, he just seems like he'd murder her anyway, so I don't know why the writers don't have her give him the candy regardless. Is it to imply that maybe he would spare you if you humoured the spirit of Halloween, trick or treat Sam style? Or is it to give us a fringe of hope that if we played our cards right and were just nice and kind to others and behaved with grace, we might too avoid the disembowelment of the century, because I don't believe either are true judging by his past actions. So Art heads back into the house and gruesomely murders this woman, scalping her, taking the skin off her face, cutting her limbs off, etc. The whole time she is screaming her lungs out and man, when Art ran back into the room with bleach and salt, I could only laugh. Oh, scalping. Look at all that. Cranberry juice. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> oh dear. Oh man. <laughs> oh, come on! <laughs> I'm supposed to submit a complaint after this. <laughs> She's not going to recognise her fingerprint, is it? <laughs> Salt! Nice and clean. <laughs> this guy's so fucking strong. I've tried so many times to rip a woman's face off with my bare hands, and I can't do it. It is such a ridiculous scene. We cut to Sienna dropping a fat downer vibe on the party she's been invited to. Her friends want to have fun, she keeps talking about her dad that died, and I can understand both sides here. When you've been someone's emotional rock for a long time during a bereavement and you want to let loose and just be drunk and stupid for a few hours, it can be really frustrating to have them still pulling you aside to talk about their feelings, you know? There's a time and a place and sometimes it can feel selfish for them to do that. On the other side of the coin, we all grieve in different ways and it seems like the death of Sienna's father was very recent, so despite the utter doom and gloom heavy conversations she's laying on her friend at a party, it does look like she needs help right now. It can be really tiring to be someone's emotional rock 24-7, but at the same time it probably also sucks to lose a parent, no matter how recent it is. What I couldn't justify however was Sienna getting her drink spiked with Mandy to liven her up a bit. If you don't have the energy for the conversation, Brooke, just walk away. While all that nonsense is afoot, Sienna's mum comes home to find her car is covered in shaving cream and the symptoms of general vandalism, which she angrily blames on Jonathan? Really? You really think it's the boy who still calls you mummy? Wiping shaving cream off the window, she comes face to face with Art, who whips out a shotgun and blasts her head open. Jonathan later finds what's left of his mother at the kitchen table, only to be chased and captured by Art with a syringe needle that puts him to sleep. When we cut to the friends in the car together, I was like, nah, sorry, I'm bored. Let's watch something else and come back to this later because I am dying here. So we did. About four days later, my friend Elliot helped refresh our memory of events and we dove back in. My only note for the remaining hour or so of Terrifier 2 was goes on too long, because goes on too long it does. If the first two thirds of this movie involved setting up a very boring premise surrounding a very boring family of people, the final third of this movie pays off on that premise through a sequence of some of the most bland action sequences I've ever seen. So it turns out that when we were watching, we turned the movie off just before the carnival scene, which makes up the bulk of the remaining hour or so, remaining 40-ish minutes. 
In the car with her shit friends, who are not sorry for spiking her with Mandy, Sienna gets a call from who she believes is Jonathan, but it's really the spooky clown girl speaking with his voice down the phone, which is a neat little trick. She tells Sienna to come and find her at the fairground, and Sienna agrees. I don't understand why they needed to have Jonathan alive for this if they could mimic his voice that well. Surely all you need is a voice to lure this girl in, but whatever, I digress. Jonathan is in The Terrifier, a haunted house-style amusement amenity? It's not a ride, more like one of those scary sets you walk through and things jump out at you, but anyway he wakes up in a room full of creepy dolls, finding that he is not alone. The clown girl is here, slicing her face open and giggling. Fair enough. We cut back to the couple in the car to watch our man get his dick stabbed about 50 times. There was apparently some talk of filming art turning the disembodied penis into a balloon animal, but I feel like you'd need a really inflatable penis to pull something off like that. Brooke has suddenly forgotten where the keys are, and she's also forgotten how to drive, so before she can finish slowly and deliberately getting the car going, like the classic horror movie femoid she is, Art shows up at the window, smashes the glass, and drags her out. She runs into The Terrifier and meets a fairly grisly end in what looks like the Silent Hill 2 bathroom, getting acid to the face until her skin bubbles and melts away, then bashing her to death with a bat covered in cutlery. This was a visually cool death, I don't know where Art got the acid from, but it worked. There's all this bubbling, melting flesh, and Brooke's actress makes this scene look every bit as painful as it presumably would be, it's hard to watch. Sienna arrives too late and ends up falling to the ground beside her friend's body, staring up at a nonchalant Art. This is the first of a few scenes that completely neuter Art, both as a character and as a threat. From this point on, he doesn't achieve much whatsoever, and yeah yeah, it could be because he's her dad, but we don't know that's the case yet. While Sienna is just sitting at Art's feet like that weird milk picture, she sees Jonathan behind him toddling out, and the first thing she does is shout his name, really loud, causing Art to turn around and notice him. Yeah, this does give Sienna the opportunity to bash Art's leg, but I couldn't help but marvel at the moment. Art lunges at Sienna, and despite the surgical precision he murdered Brooke and her boyfriend with, literally ending their lives in like five seconds of peace, he starts in effectually throwing Sienna around the room. It was like watching two Marvel heroes fight each other, just two morons bouncing each other off the walls while loud music plays. And then, when he's got the upper hand, he knocks her to the floor and just leaves her on the floor, rather than killing her, marking the start of one of the most drawn-out action sequences in film where I cared about absolutely no one and was not even remotely excited. The issue I have with Art is that his stakes are pretty high, so if a character is going to die, then they will just die. The second you see Art in a fight that lasts longer than 10 seconds, you know that there are zero stakes here. This is just tension-raising padding, but the issue with an entity like Art is that, by design, he loses all tension once he's in sustained stabbing range. Drawn-out hand-to-hand combat doesn't work for horror movie antagonists like Art the Clown. When Jonathan thinks he's escaped out of an emergency exit, he runs straight into Art, who grabs him by the throat, holding him entirely at his mercy, and then merely slashes Jonathan across the cheek. A bad cut, yes, but hardly the treatment we've seen Art dole out so far. The issue with this minor injury is that we immediately now know that Jonathan isn't going anywhere, otherwise he'd already be dead, and so the stakes have evaporated for both siblings within the space of about a minute. Briefly saved by Sienna, the two of them run, but Sienna has to stop for a sit-down before they even escape escape the terrifier itself. Like, I know that a slash on the stomach probably hurts quite a lot, but can we at least make it out of the front door before we stop for a little cry and a talk? Rather than just sitting on a bit of furniture in the middle of the room and curling up, we could maybe go and feel the wind on our face a bit, Sienna. Art naturally shows up again, and he and Sienna have like an eight minute fight in this church, just ineffectual blows, back and forth, back and forth. I zoned out for this really hard. In another movie, this would be fine, but I came to the Terrifier series to feel the purest version of human repulsion, so it seems like this don't work. Art slashes Sienna a ton of times with a razor wire, she hits him a ton of times, they wrestle, he flings her around the room, she stabs him with a poker, blows bounce off each other. Nothing actually does any damage, it's just boring. This concept really doesn't suit these scenes at all. It's too obviously padding, too obviously holding off until a later scene when Sienna can do something a bit more definitive. They end up in a back room full of scrap metal, and there's another short fight, and by this point I was really starting to fidget. Still, despite my terminal boredom, we do get another one of those damn bitch shot compilation moments. Art throws Sienna through some wooden boards on the floor, and we get one of the better scenes visually of Terrified 2. Sienna lands on a floor covered in pebbles, with an eerily lit red foggy gate embedded into the ground with like showbiz mirror lights around it. I quite like this scene, I think it looked brilliant. It's eerie and unusually still and silent in the chaos, it's otherworldly almost. Not just because of the location of this weird door, but the way in which everything just stopped. This moment is very memorable.
memorable. I just wish it was in a more enjoyable film. Art appears behind Sienna and stabs her through the stomach with the magic sword, and she falls into the hole. What a surprise. He throws the knife down after her, again, maybe implying a fatherly connection, but at this point I was pretty checked out. As I've said before, Sienna's invincibility and equal fighting ability to a clown who spends all of his free time killing people makes this feel like a self-insert fanfiction, where an attractive girl with a magic weapon finds out she's secretly Art's daughter and gets to walk around in a sexy costume, never taking any proper damage and overcoming all odds so that she can beat him. And with that kind of Mary Sue writing, we also get Mary Sue stakes, which are sub-zero. Sienna wakes up in a glass case full of water, a tentacle holding her under, drowning. We see the clown cafe again, there's a lot of blood, a lot of gory visuals, and I'm not quite sure what this is supposed to represent. This scene goes on for ages. Sienna screams, breathing out bubbles the entire time for several minutes. With what breath? Sienna, how much air do you have in you? For a significant amount of time she's just scratching at her throat in a desperate I'm about to drown way before continuing to struggle and scream for another several minutes. It really goes on for so long, presumably so that we can see the entire clown cafe scene play out, but it just doesn't work. It just becomes a bunch of edgy creepypasta scenes with little to no impact. At this point the knife resurrects Sienna and she just removes the tentacle and then floats back up to the surface. Heading back into the real world, Sienna fights Art again. As the fight concludes, Art is brought to his knees. At this point, he kind of nods at Sienna, encouraging her to behead him. She beheads Art and leaves his head for the clown girl to pick up, play with, and leave with. There is a final scene to this film, but we were so happy that it was over that we just closed the window, missed it entirely. I had to be told about it later. Overall, Terrifier 1 is a silly bit of fun and a brilliant flexing of creative muscles by the visual effects team. The performances are carried entirely by Art's actor, who injects each scene with like a nonchalant brand of whimsy that keeps everything light enough to be funny despite the brutal on-screen depictions. Well, mostly brutal. I found the tension before each kill to be worse than the kill themselves, but some of them are pretty intense. Terrifier 2, however, ended up just being really boring to me. I understand that they might be trying to set some things up for Terrifier 3, which is due to release in 2024, and maybe they have a lot of ground that they need to cover before they start doing that. But all in all, Terrifier 2 is full of bland characters having these bland interactions that don't pay off whatsoever. You might be feeding us breadcrumbs for things, like maybe Art is Sienna's father, maybe that theory is legitimate, but I think you should at least still pay that off in some way in Terrifier 2, rather than leaving it until presumably Terrifier 3, if at all, if it is true. Because instead we just ended up with 2 hours and 20 minutes of pure fucking around. Terrifier 2 was excruciating in all the wrong ways, which was a shame because I had seen like the costume shop scene previously and was super excited to see what they were going to continue to do with Art's character. Ah well. Let's hope Terrifier 3 finds the middle ground between plot devoid gore trash and uh, some of the blandest developments in cinema history. So, wanted to say a massive thank you to Cool Shirts for sponsoring this video, especially since it's definitely going to get demonetized. I also again wanted to thank you for watching, and I wanted to give an extra special thanks to my patrons for supporting me, as usual. And an extra special thank you, as always, to Alice Teeters, Brian Bullock, Bile Hamaho Futh, Brendan Sidereal, Brody Cullen, Carl DeRocha, Fosh, Heidi, HM, Julia, and Sam Jones for being my highest tier patrons. Really appreciate you guys, thank you very much, and I'll see you all in the next video.